Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. We're going to do a seven line prayer of Guru Rinpoche first. Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, God with great knowledge of human conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, Thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks of faiths like a stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds who are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, fields of ocean-like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms. Unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having the state of the all seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the oceans of existence, stirred by waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. 
I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion. Please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam, guru, ratna, mandala, kam, niryatiani. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on a mass of vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity, perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this. Correctly and repeatedly, those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, not without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. 
Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Dayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Repeat to yourself 20 times silently. Tayata, gate gate, paragate, parasam gate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva, Arya, Avlukteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, some the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagata rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivatiputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the worlds of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised at that spoken by the Bhagavan. Now we'll be turning it over to Matthew, our main speaker for today. Oh. Am I? Yeah, it's on. I'm really happy that there's prayers because it's always a bit difficult to, for me to sit in front of people and speak. I tend to get um, anxious. And uh, I have had a history of like, uh, social anxiety and um, panic attacks. And so it's like really helpful to go through prayers and be here with all of you for 15 minutes speaking before I get going. Um, I like to do a short uh, invocation before I get started. That's Om, reverence to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I bow down and go for refuge to the feet of the excellent Holy Lama Yeshe Jimpa, who has great compassion. May the words I speak reflect this compassion and may my intention to be a source of help and liberation to all sentient beings. May our conduct as a Sangha accord with the way, allowing our teacher to rain down the highest instruction beyond any effort. Like a conductor and orchestra, the Dharma music we create is based upon how we play together. My name is Matthew Cruz. I, um, I started um, studying Buddhism in the, the Zen school in 2006. And then uh, in 2017, just because of where I happened to be living, I was close to Lion's Roar. And Lion's Roar had a child's program. And I have a small child. I have three children. One is doing tech. He's grown. <laughs> Eli, thank you so much. Um, and so I started coming around and getting to know uh, Lama Jimpa and uh, really appreciated the connection that we made. And so in uh, 2019, on March 31st, I took refuge in uh, here and with this Sangha. And uh, today I will be speaking about um, Buddhist morality and ethics, which is part of what's called the three higher trainings. And so these kind of create like a, a triangle that lifts our spiritual practice up, and that's um, concentration, uh, morality, ethics, and wisdom. And Lama Jimpa says that uh, concentration is the base 
of the triangle. And so I take that to mean that if um, I am unable to concentrate, then I am unable to act in ethical and moral ways and therefore unable to develop uh, wisdom further. Uh, that would be a negative way of saying it. So a positive way of saying it would be the more I develop my concentration, the more I'm able to stay present and have discipline with my moral and ethical conduct. And from that, wisdom arises or enter the state of wisdom that's here. Um, and we have a way in this uh, discipline tradition to uh, cultivate concentration that's called shamatha meditation and I'm hoping that um, we'll do some of that together later. Uh, so the three higher trainings I was talking about, I kind of like to like build a map of what I'm going to talk about. So this is part of that map. There's the three higher trainings, right? So uh, morality and ethics are part of that and those three higher trainings are part of these six trainings called the six perfections or the six paramitas. And so the other three are generosity, patience, and vigor or energy that we need. So we, we need to cultivate those six things to have a spiritual practice. Um, also, I guess we should say, so we're at Lion's Roar Dharma Center, Dona Darge Temple in Sacramento, California. I don't actually know what today's date is. It's February 13th, 2022. So we know what we're, what we're talking about, kind of a basic scheme of where it fits uh, in the doctrine. And we also know like physically where we're at and what time period. Um, so today to talk about Buddhist morality and ethics, um, I'm gonna talk about the five precepts. Um, which is kind of like the, the basics in morality for what it means to be a Buddhist. And we take those five precepts or vows when we take refuge. So I want to go over that briefly too. So if you remember in the prayers, we said, um, I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. And we said that three times. And then we said, I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha by the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma. May I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. Uh, this is an important framework toward looking at Buddhist morality, I think is... Westerners, um, if someone would have told me that a large part of being a Buddhist was about ethics or morality, I would have been like, okay, now I'm really out of here. Um, reason being, like, I was trying to avoid contact with um, spiritual traditions in which there was a, um, an eye in the sky a, a judgmental or punishing God. Um, I, I don't, that concept doesn't resonate with me. And um, so the idea of morality and ethics because of coming out of that tradition and having that as like the framework of how I saw morality uh, being created um, had me, uh, uh, what's it? avert, aversion, I, I would avert myself to that. So the reason I bring that up is I feel like Buddhist morality is handled in a very different way and that um, it's looked at in terms of harm reduction and wellness. And so when I'm looking at morality from a Buddhist point of view, I'm looking at a way of being that decreases harm and encourages well-being in my life and the life of those around me. So how that relates to refuge is um, life is difficult and there are many challenges and 
uh, we need to have safe harbor. There needs to be some sort of positive qualities for us to take shelter in during the, the normal storms of life. Some of these storms we refer to as samsara. Um, so samsara is like, I think in other traditions would talk about the world. Like we're renouncing the world. Um, you know, I like to think about it as, uh, okay, like a, if, what is a spiritual path? Like, I don't, I don't believe in this higher authority, in this thing. I don't believe that I have a, a inherent spirit or something that carries on. So spiritual always kind of gets me anyway. It doesn't seem to be the accurate thing to say, but I say spiritual life because like that's what our language uses, right? So I think of it in terms of um, how do I create more meaning in my life and how do I come into relationship with all things in my life, whether they're physical objects, people, creatures, concepts, how do I enter into relationship with those, with these things, and create a meaningful existence in those relationships? So with uh, Buddha, we have a relationship with an example of what we can be. And in this tradition, Buddha nature is inherent in all of us. And Buddha nature is described as um, being open, clear, and free, like uh, the bright blue sky. And that there is a knowing in that space and that knowing is beyond conceptual thought. So I kind of always think about that, like, um, you know, if you have a dog and like you stand up to leave the house, like the dog knows you're leaving on a walk, right? Like it doesn't have to think about it. Like it's not thinking like, oh, my owner's walking to the hallway and now picking up the leash. This must mean we are going for a walk. Like the dog's just there, not bothered by anything watching, unobstructed, sees what's happening and knows, knows what's going on, right? But we're human. So if a dog can know so much just being beyond conceptual thinking, I can only imagine what we're capable of perceiving when we're in a free and open state, you know, without our mind being cluttered by a lot of conceptual thought. So how we learn to kind of get to that state is through the Dharma, another refuge we have, and that is both the teachings on how to get there and then the actual doing of it, the truth of the way things are. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's Sangha, and that's all of us We're here. We're helping each other do this by coming into relation with each other. And practicing what that means to be in good relation. Um, and so we're going to do that, and then it goes on to the intention, right? So we're going to do that until I am enlightened. So we have this personal goal of getting enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and the positive potential by create, uh, created by listening to the Dharma. We want to be that Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. So it's more than just doing it for ourselves. We're gonna do that for everybody else. And hopefully in a song, everybody else is doing it for everybody else, right? Um, so that's, that's our intention. And I say that because what's, what's not said here is that in the taking of the refuge, we also take these five vows which are the base for Buddhist morality, our ethics. Um, I've kind of like gone off notes. So I'm just gonna see if I, how much I added or, yeah, so let's talk, well, what are they? <laughs> 
Oh, I also think of them too. It's kind of like a whip and a carrot, you know? So we have like the example and the warm stuff. We have friends, we have teachings, like we have all the warm stuff to take shelter in. And then like the precepts are kind of like, there's where we're going to rub up against where we're cluttered, where we have clutter and we're not open and free. And, um, Uh, I think also the reason it's these five is it's the, the primary ways that humans try to escape the difficulty of life without taking ownership of themselves, without living in an empowered way. Uh, so, the, so what we say in the refuge ceremony is having taken refuge, we pledge to uphold the five precepts in order to support our Dharma practice and the Dharma practice of others. And we take the five precepts. I undertake the precept of refraining from killing. I undertake the precept of refraining from stealing. I undertake the precept of refraining from lying. I undertake the precept of refraining from sexual misconduct. And I undertake the precept of refraining from intoxicants. So if, if we use killing, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, or intoxication to move away from, uh, from the difficulties of life, which would be like uh, attachment, anger, delusion, confusion, um, will actually cause more of that. So if we remain in these states using the, those tools, uh, we'll actually make our lives worse, right? We'll continue to harm ourselves and we'll probably um, increase that effect, which you know we all have heard the term karma. So we'll make worse karma for ourselves. Karma translated as cause and effect. So if we create the causes and conditions for our own ill being, for our own harm, we'll get more of that. And so will those around us. Um, again, I bring that up to really emphasize that um, working with this morality isn't from a judgmental place. So um, I have a couple quotes that I think are neat that I guess I wasn't supposed to talk about yet. But um, yeah, I'll wait, I'll wait. Okay, so <laughs> how, how, I, how I think of, of it is like coming home to myself. So if, I mean, I was probably like uh, 42, 41, 42 before I, uh, ever was like in a spot where I just felt like, oh, I'm okay. Like this, like actually being in my body feels good and everything in my life is okay. Like there's problems going on, but I feel capable of encountering them and dealing with them. Like I don't feel stressed right now and I'm okay. And it was amazing to me how good just being okay felt you know because i was like really like the first time like wow this is really nice like it's okay and i was happy to be alive you know and i don't and i think that i consider that like coming home to my spiritual self i was just in an okay open place and i i think we've all felt that so i i think of that as buddha nature i know i don't stay there all the time but I know that that makes sense to me as a goal. I don't think this is something that's unreachable for us. You know, but first we have to like kind of take some time and do a little work to identify like, oh, this is what it feels, this is what bliss feels like. This is what openness feels like. 
this is what it feels like to be in peace, to be relaxed, you know? But if we can figure out how to get there, it's really nice, right? And so then it's like, well, when do I leave that place? What makes me leave that? What makes it hard to get back? And in working with the five precepts, it's very clear to me that doing these activities push me out of that place and keep me from coming back because then I have to deal with the effects of those actions and it's difficult. Um, the precepts can also like, we should just, Lama, Lama Jinpa always says like, it's a full stop. Like, don't do these things anymore, right? Like, be kind to yourself. Don't, don't do them. Be kind to your friends, right? And that's the real basic understanding, I think, right? Like, we all know what don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't be involved in sexual misconduct, and don't intoxicate ourselves is. Um, sometimes I think also coming from maybe a, a more... Uh, puritanical background, our country, sexual misconduct can be a little bit confusing for people. Lama always says, um, just be a generous lover, right? We're not, we're not trying to get judgy with anybody with how they express themselves or anything. If, if we're being generous, if we're being loving, this is good. Um, so, from that basic point that we can all kind of understand they're very straightforward uh, and we start to rest more and more in our own spiritual home inside of ourselves i think that path narrows and these precepts start to take on uh, a, a more subtle meanings and that's our path that's our individual path you know so i don't want to get into saying like it is like this, you know, but I do want to maybe offer some fodder to get thinking about for you in your own life, what helps you stay home and what pushes you out and how you can start working with that to see like what makes you feel best, what behaviors help you feel best and have the best relationships that you can have in your life. And so we got the basic or like conventional understanding over here. And then, you know, and then there's like monastic understanding. So like the traditional requirements for precepts are there has to be an object, an intention. So that would be like, I like this cup. It is the object, the intention. I want that cup. I'm going to take that cup. I know it doesn't belong with me. The perception, it doesn't belong to me, but I'm going to take it, right? The effort. I. I'm taking it, and the result, I've stolen it, right? So there's those, those pieces. I don't want to get into too much in that. There's a lot in, like, the Vinayan around um, monastics where, like, the rules get super specific. And my guess is that over hundreds of years, there's been monks, like, figuring out with object, intention, perception, effort, and result how they can get around certain rules or, like, trying to argue why <laughs> that really wasn't them breaking it and also right like i'm being kind of silly but also like there is probably like real wholehearted effort of like how do i really improve karma and if this is the base how can i get very specific you know and they're really working in a positive way to create the best karma they actually can for themselves and those around them um so that's like kind of one side of it. We've got the basics, then we start getting specific with rational, intellectual understanding. And then we start getting into what's called like more ultimate understanding, our alt, the perception of ultimate reality as it is. And so like, that would be stuff like Bodhidharma said that in the ultimate view, the only honest or right speech is silence. Um, so if we practice morality really well, uh, we become virtuous, right? We've heard that word. So Alan Watts uh, said that the actual state of virtuousness does not conceive itself as virtue. And that only lower virtue is so self-conscious as to think itself virtuous, and therefore it is not. 
And he goes on to say, you do not congratulate yourself for developing your beautiful eyes. Yet their development is of the most highest and ultimate virtue. And you do not conceive of yourself as virtuous with every breath you take, though breathing is living and existence is virtuous. And I, I don't feel like I understand enough to get too into like trying to explain ultimate reality or virtue in the sense of ultimate reality. But I do think having a taste of that is very helpful so that I don't get dogmatic and I don't get um, so rule-based that um, I'm ready to, to punish others or, or take on um, some, you know, some sense of being on high. Uh, and as Confucius said, it is the goody goodies that are the thieves of virtue. <laughs> and from the Christian tradition, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, Lama has also said that uh, when it comes to the precepts, just get really good at one. Uh, I, I also read that um, the, the Buddha believed that if you were born into a human life, which is very precious, in your last life, you were at least really good at one. And so you had to have been good at one. So let's try to keep going. That seems to me when I've been working with the precepts that uh, the lines between them start to get blurred. And if I'm upholding one really quickly, there's no other that won't be confronted. You know, I can't be honest, be completely honest and be stealing, right? So they, they all work together actually. And there is a concept of what's called a root break of a precept. And that's where one of the precepts is broken so extremely that all of the other um, precepts are broken at the same time. And we have, it's called a root break because we have a complete severance from connection with our own spiritual self. Most of the, um, in the traditional teachings, most of the time if we break a precept, we can uh, kind of go through our own process of confession you know, like admitting to ourselves, okay, I broke this precept and then really developing a feeling of regret about doing that behavior. And like, and then really like, and then we, you know, we don't stay in that negative hole. We get positive about it. Like, okay, you know, but there's virtuous people out there and they're helping. And like, I've got good friends and like, I'm going to be virtuous too. Right. So it's, we lift ourselves out of that. We don't want to stay in that hole. It's not self-loathing. Right. So we lift ourselves back up by looking at virtue when we do that, but with a root break, um, it can take much, much more than that. And um, if that's something you've encountered and you're feeling that loss, I would highly recommend um, working with finding a teacher that can help you um, create that connection with yourself again. Mom is a good guy. Saying, <laughs> throw that out there. Um, and, uh, the Dalai Lama has said that the five precepts, if everyone followed the five precepts, there would be no more harm in the world. You know, it might not be a super spiritually developed world. It might not be like uh, Shambhala yet, but we would at least not be doing harm to ourselves or others. Um, and then uh, I think, Throughout time, if we look at laws, if we look at uh, cultural norms, or if we look at um, uh, fashion of the time, we know that all of these things change. You know, binding of women's feet was seen as good at a time. Uh, killing Mormons was legal here for a while. We actually believed certain people actually believed that smoking cigarettes was a cause for health 
is the condition for health. So we know that like so much changes. I, I believe that the precepts are eternal. It doesn't matter what place or what time we look at those precepts, they will always be non-harmful. They will always be helping people work towards well-being and move away from ill-being. Another way to look at them is if it's a negative, like I'm not going to do this behavior anymore, then what do we move towards, right? A positive. And so this is from uh, a Chinese uh, monk. So I undertake the precept of refraining from killing and instead move toward protecting all life and cultivating compassionate connection. Uh, I undertake the precept of refraining from stealing. Instead, we're moving toward generosity to all people, all beings. I undertake the precept of refraining from lying, and I'm moving toward kind and loving speech. Uh, that dichotomy, uh, Lama says, is probably the hardest. And I know that's always been a tough one for me. Like this, sometimes me being honest doesn't land in a kind and loving way to the people I'm speaking to. And so these things are very alive. You know, it's not just like a rule, like the basic. We can do the basic right now, but there's more and life is complicated. And so it is important to work with those in this way. How do I say truthful things in a kind and loving way? Uh, I undertake the precept of refraining from sexual misconduct and move towards cultivating the integrity of all beings. Uh, integrity means the state of being whole and undivided. And I undertake the precept of refraining from intoxicants and move towards consuming only items that relate to physical and mental well being. So uh, now I'd like to present. Uh, five precepts from uh, a woman named uh, Pema Kondro, who's a Lama in the uh, um, Nyingma and Kaigyu traditions, where the Lupa school. Um, so we're more of a monastic school. Um, Nyingma and uh, Kaigyu are yogic generally consider yogic schools, so yogis are householders, which most of us are, other than long talk. And um, she operates in uh, like worldwide, but is primarily in the Bay Area and has a retreat center in the Tahoe National Forest that like just opened before the um, pandemic. So, oh, actually, have a bunch of these of people. Um, pass those that way and pass those that way. Um, so this is, I think, uh, more in-depth fodder to consider how to practice the precepts. Uh, instead of do not kill, uh, she phrases it, avoid harming other beings. And I think it's interesting that the Tibetan, the actual translation is, do not cut the life force. And she says, uh, committed to non-aggression, I resolve to avoid harming others, to avoid injuring the body or mind of myself or others. I resolve conflicts and tensions with an attitude of openness and loving kindness. Acknowledging transgressions and seeking reconciliations. I base my dietary choices on compassionate intention, rather than taking the attitude that the ends justify the means. I commit to nonviolence as the base, the path, and the fruit of my actions. I resolve to relieve the suffering of beings wherever I see it and to make compassionate connections with everything everywhere. Uh, as a tantric practitioner, I really liked her uh, recognition of energy and 
um, that killing is the cutting off of living energy. And so this offers us a lot of um, room to look at it in a more subtle way about, you know, we could even, some people are even thinking like, well, if I cut the energy of a positive situation, right, I'm, I'm killing that energy. You know, what is it to eat flesh, dead flesh, as opposed to like living energetic foods? Um, and again, not like passing judgment. I eat meat sometimes, but what what is that to us? What helps us stay home? What's making us leave? If something is keeps bothering me and I know that that's bothering me, like I need to come into relation with that and begin to change my relationship so that I'm no longer bothered. Uh, number two, take avoiding taking what has not been given. Uh, I avoid taking what is not freely given. I exert to avoid depriving others through my presence in this world, to avoid exploitation of others and to avoid squandering resources. I avoid misusing the time and generosity of others. I avoid misusing my authority or status and I respect the autonomy needs and rights of others. I avoid robbing others of meaning and value by respecting others' perspectives and religious beliefs. I avoid taking advantage of others' generosity and laziness or carelessness. I exert to educate myself on issues of racism, sexual abuse, colonialism, environmental destruction, animal cruelty, and other issues of exploitation in order to use my time and my life to further respect for the dignity of myself, others, and the earth. I take responsibility to help when help is needed, helping according to my capacity. I resolve to be a giver more than a taker. I commit myself to contribute generously to everything I am connected to. I bring the spirit of service, sharing, giving, forgiving, and inclusivity to my activities. Recognizing the innate richness in myself and others, I train to live in a gracious attitude of hospitality and altruism. Uh, again, like her uh, understanding of the like deep problems of our time and of energy, like that I can steal someone else's time, I can steal their attention and I can steal their, their energy, I can drain them. Um, number three, avoiding sexual misconduct, abandon sexual misconduct. I remain always in respect by treating myself and others with dignity through the respecting through respecting the intrinsically complete Buddha nature of myself and others. When I have a partner, I respect my intimate partner at all levels as an equal partner. I recognize that celibacy and non-celibacy have the same principle, to devote the body to liberation of oneself and others. Therefore, I commit my sexuality or celibacy for the realized union of body, mind, and emotions and for the integrity of self, other, community, and society. I avoid sexual exploitation, manipulation, deception, discrimination, harassment, and objectification. I undermine misogyny by respecting marriage, relationships, and sexuality. I undermine abuse and infidelity by being transparent and honest about my relationship status. I undermine abuse by seeking enthusiastic verbal consent in my romantic relationships. I understand that consent may not be possible in asymmetrical power relationships. I disentangle sexual relationships from asymmetrical power relationships in order to undermine the patriarchal systems that have exploited women, girls, and other vulnerable and marginalized people for centuries. I recognize that causing others to break their vows is the same as breaking vows myself, and therefore I abide by the vows of others, refraining for sexual relationships with monastics or those in monogamous relationships. I respect the expression of the spectrum of genders within myself and others as it manifests according to each person's art of being. <clears throat> I think it's beautiful that uh, she talks about um, the 
different gender expressions within ourself in this tradition. Um, like you can see in some of the tankas, you'll see male and female in union, and um, that is both happening outside of us and inside of us. Um, and abandon false speech. I avoid taking refuge in the lie of dualism, ever advancing toward less manipulative, self-protective, deceptive speech. I refrain from using my speech for rationalizing neurotic views and behavior. I refrain from all bigoted, sectarian, racist, sexist, judgmental, and arrogant speech that condemns others. I avoid harsh speech, gossip, and useless chatter. I develop increasing capacity for deep listening and authentic communication. I train my speech and emotions in order to use speech with nonviolence, empathy, sensitivity, and kindness. I use kind speech to set appropriate boundaries and respect others' boundaries in calmness and clarity. I respect confidentiality and respect the disclosures of others. I refrain from offering unsolicited advice. I recognize that silence or withholding can be a misuse of speech. I speak up to prevent others from being harmed by racism, sexism, abuse, and other forms of domination. And lastly, avoiding, instead of um, do not intoxicate, she phrases it, avoiding loss of awareness, which I think is interesting. Uh, this is the one precept that's um, not considered, the act of it is not considered the harmful part. It's not inherently harmful to be intoxicated. It's generally seen that uh, the intoxication piece will lead to the breaking of the other precepts. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that completely because I think of it in terms of, um, again, that spiritual home, and I'm not sure how, uh, having spent a lot of time intoxicated, I don't think I was spiritually home when I was. Like, even if I was having a good time, it wasn't like a uh, deep, meaningful type of um, understanding self and being in um, good relation with all things. So, uh, you know, there's some, I'm sure that's a whole talk in of itself. Uh, I embrace the radical sobriety of the unaltered state and give myself over to naturally intoxicated appreciation of the phenomenal world. I avoid deliberate loss of awareness through substance use or abuse. I avoid mindless consumption of anything. I avoid spiritual delusions that put me out of touch with common sense, morality, and shared experiences of conventional reality. I apply renunciation where necessary. I avoid what clouds my mind and adhere to diet, drinks, and medicines, which bring forth pristine presence, sanity, compassionate awareness for my body, mind, my family, my community, and my society. Um, I have kind of a harsh story to end it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, another way of looking at this is when we're caught in some sorrow, we're grasping for security, for um, power, for uh, uh, pleasure in, in a way that is inherently destructive. And so this harm that we create for ourselves and others, this confusion, anger, greed, attachment, etc., comes from uh, trying to get what we already have, really. We're already existing. We already have it. And so this is a, um, a short story about one of Tsongkhapa's students named Drog. And he's um, doing some work for Tsongkhapa by like going to different monasteries. And he's staying at a monastery, this one monastery, for a while. And he watches like what's going on. And um, 
he's with like the abbot and some of the higher monks one day and he's sitting there and he's like he just says um i really I, you guys are really compassionate all the all the stuff that you all these ceremonies and this chanting and this meditating you're doing here it's it's very compassionate i really appreciate you guys you're such compassionate men like this is really great that you're doing all this and they're all like, okay he goes but you know if you got if you find the time you could you could do something spiritual and they're just kind of like what? what's up with this guy you know and um and so like a couple of weeks go by and he, he says it again to him he's sitting there and he goes man you guys are so compassionate like it's so great how you're doing all this stuff you're like running this monastery you know you're getting everybody to do all the things it'd be really great if you did something spiritual finally one of them go what what are you what are you talking about and drog sits up really straight and he goes stop trying to get something out of life That's a, i don't know what it means <laughs> okay uh thank you all for coming i really appreciate it and listening to me i know that was a long one i would like to meditate together, but I think we definitely need a break because I read so much stuff. You think like a 10 minute break and then we'll that's meditate. Like that's oh, that's a good idea. Uh, if you go right down this hall through the shoe room, it'll turn right. The men is on the left. If you take a left after that, the women's is on the left beyond that. And if you keep going straight beyond those into the like through a small foyer into the next room, there's water and cups. So you could get a drink. Um, is there any announcements? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to do them now? We should do them. I feel like we should do them. So, um, oh, <laughs> so. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say a few things I know, but um, I won't be, remember them all. I know myself very well. But um, this one is a very big one. And it's next Sunday will be a, a very special person coming here. And his name is Kenshin Rinpoche. And he is a really, really amazing uh, teacher and also a very dear friend. And he's going to do a transmission. It's more than a teaching. It's called a transmission of what's called Six Session Guru Yoga. And everybody is welcome to attend. It'll begin at 11, and it's in two sessions. And there'll be a break at um, uh, after the first session. You know, I, we have these times, but to be honest, um, with our friends, our Tibetan monastics, we just go by their time. So uh, we have the first session it's from like 11 to 1, and then lunch. And that lunch is. Uh, if you do come, if you could bring something that you love to, to eat yourself, and we could all share what we will all bring something, and then together we'll make a, a feast that we can share together. So then after the lunch, um, there'll be a second session. So uh, um, my friend Susan Farrar here is sort of organizing this. And so uh, maybe you would like to say something more towards it, Susan. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, I'm Susan, and I'm kind of sort of helping to organize um, next Sunday. So as Patty was saying, we're going to have a, a potluck type lunch during the break. And um, generally vegetarian food, little casseroles, rice, bean, quinoa, that kind of stuff, salads. Pita and dip, fruit, you know, nuts, just that kind of stuff. So if you're going to come, it would be very much appreciated to bring food. Um, somebody's already bringing water, so we're cool there. We will have coffee and tea anyway. Um, and the other thing that we need help with, if you want to um, stick around or, or come a little early, is setting up tables and chairs. And there's always cleanup afterwards, so we really could use some help with that too. And finally, Lumtok here could use um, some assistance 
with the tech work. So if you are interested in learning a little bit about our technology here and how we work with folks um, online, and people online, if you're coming, this is also a plea for, um, for help in terms of food and or just set up and clean up assistance. I know I've already got some folks that have responded, but the more the merrier. Um, so anyway, if you want to help with tech and maybe learn a little bit about our tech, talk to Loon Talk afterwards. Maybe could we also do a pre-cleaning party Saturday at one o'clock? Yeah, so if you guys want to help clean the temple beforehand on Saturday, next Saturday at one o'clock, I know there's some other events going on, but um, come on over. We'll have some tasks to do. Just scrub the place down. It's good to do anyways. Okay, thanks. So talk to Patty or me or Lung Tuk, um and hang out afterwards. We always hang out for a while afterwards. Thanks. There's also a new garden project going on right now. Two new flower beds are being created and planted. So if you would like to be a part of that, please talk to me or Peter. There's more. There's always more. There's so much going on here. And, uh, Is that <laughs> There's so much going on here. And uh, the main thing to know is that everybody's welcome to everything. And um, you know, you see some people sitting down here on cushions, but everybody's welcome to sit on these cushions, of course. Maybe I, I just want to make sure people realize that we're all doing this together and everybody's welcome to all of our things. And um, we have something going on every single day. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Patty. And with that, thank you, Eli, for doing tech. Thank you for Umze and Jules. Appreciate you all. Let's uh, take a 10 minute break and we'll meet back here at 1215 to meditate. Oh, sorry, we should do closing prayers. <laughs> Sorry, can you guys just help me? Okay. Okay. Is it on? Cool. So we're starting with dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezing, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make the request at your holy feet. That concludes prayers. Thank you, Matthew, for a beautiful talk. So we'll meet back at 1215.
and we'll sit quietly do you want me to call people? and do our best to concentrate on an object, like our breath, for instance. And if we drift away, we'll just come back.
Thanks for sitting together, everyone. And now we can have some social time. Um, also, please don't forget, uh, you can make tax-deductible donations online. There's also um, some boxes near the doors if you'd like to donate. Thank you so much. Happy Super Bowl day. <laughs> it's like a holiday. I think we should say that. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Super Bowl day. May the turkey win.